clock. So I think we'll get started. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the scrolling slides of all of our graduates and we'll get back to that in a, in a little bit, but I wanted to introduce myself because I am a new face. Um, even though it says Carolyn Matiski, I am Marissa McCasty. I'm filling in for Carolyn um, and for this session. I am the Leadership Development Manager for SUNY SAIL, um, and I just had some housekeeping things. I know being that this is the graduation and the culmination, you probably all know about these housekeeping, um, you know, things that we have to do, but um, just a few things, testing your speakers and microphone, uh, turn on your video, mute your line, um, and answer any or enter any questions that you have in the chat. We're happy to answer those um, and happy to troubleshoot if, if anyone is having an issue. And as always, this meeting will be recorded so that we can uh, listen to it again and look back on it and see how wonderful this graduation was. So uh, without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Kathleen. Thank you, Marissa. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Well, I appreciate you and Jamie putting music to that. Uh, it was fun to watch, and I really can't believe it's been a year since we launched our first RAVA program. Today, I have the honor of introducing Jeff Cheek. He's the president of the Research Foundation, and he has made time in his busy day to be with you and to celebrate this year-long uh, period of learning together. As you know, the Research Administrators Symposium was a time that many of us got to, together, which I thought was wonderful. But I think the real focus and the core of research administration has uh, been very present the past three years because of our president. And so I'm going to let him say a few words at your graduation ceremony. Jeff? Thank you, Kathleen. So congratulations to all of you on graduating from the very first Research and Administrators Virtual Academy. We had over 50 participants from 14 campuses in our central office that started this journey back in September of last year, and we've all completed 12 intense months of learning. You come from such varied backgrounds. I see that many of you work in sponsored programs, both on the pre- and the post-award side, but also appreciate the human resources and finance professionals, as well as the research assistants and administrative staff who participated. A few of you sat on curriculum panels for RAVA sessions. To each of you that did that, I express my appreciation and congratulations. I understand that your sessions span from a contracts master's class to navigating your ship through the academic minefield. I also understand that some of the more popular courses were managing your audit findings and leadership lessons from neuroscience, which seems a bit counterintuitive that they'd be so diverse, but those were the two of the most appreciated. So glad to know that those were enjoyable. I'm also glad that many of you were able to attend the research administrator symposium that we had back in the spring, because we all, everybody here thinks that it's very important that we all get as much face time together as we can. In closing of my remarks, I'd like to thank you for taking on this program and for your commitment and dedication to making this a great research foundation to support a SUNY. Special thanks to Carolyn and Marissa from the SAIL Institute and from here Central Office to Kathleen and Jamie for their continued commitment to your professional development. And finally, I'd like to also say that our speaker today, Matt Horhan from AAAS, he's a great speaker. He's been at both of our research administrator symposium. I've also heard him speak many times at COBRA meetings and DC. And given the current chaos in Washington, Matt has a great ability to just passionately, objectively explain the method behind the madness and actually make sense of what's happening in the changing funding environment. So I look forward to his talk later today. I'm going to turn this over to Scott Sherliff for introductions. Thank you, Scott. Great. Thank you, Jeff. Um, and on a personal note, I just want to congratulate everyone again. I mean, a lot of you folks I have worked with personally over the years, and I'm really excited that um, we're at this stage with this program. Um, for today's final session, we really wanted to energize this graduating cohort um, with a thoughtful session on what the future of sponsored funding may look like in a challenging time, as Dr. Cheek um, has outlined. So 
Our featured keynote speaker uh, will be Matt Hurahan, and I'll return to him in a second. And uh, Matt will be joined by panelist uh, Amy Herstack. She is an industrial contract administrator at the University of Buffalo. Amy has been in the tech transfer office for nearly four years, and she really focuses on industry-sponsored research agreements, clinical and non-clinical, um, Buffalo Institute of Genomics transactions, business and economic development team, and prior to this, uh, Amy came to us from corporate America with um, seven years at Rich Products, the general counsel's office. Um, so that is wonderful experience to bring to a campus looking to build new relationships. And our other panelists will be Matt Morose. Matt is a director of enterprise technology transfer for the Research Foundation at SUNY. And in this capacity, Matt directs the development, implementation, and management of enterprise-wide technology, business solutions and programs that advance and facilitate the marketability of SUNY innovation and the protection of SUNY intellectual property. He also manages system-wide initiatives and quite frankly has about three other jobs. <laughs> so, and then our keynote, we're going to go back to another man, Matt Horahan. Matt is the director of R&D budget and Pro um, policy program for the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences. He's a regular source of information uh, and analysis on past, present, and future science budgets for policymakers in the science community. And he has been in this very important position since 2011. Prior to joining AAAS, Matt served as Clean Energy Policy Analyst at the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation. Um, previously, he also served as a Jan Scorey Fellow at the Business Council for Sustainable Energy, which is a coalition of energy firms and utilities working to engage policymakers for market-based solutions to sustainable energy development and climate change. And we have asked Matt to come back and talk to us again. We've had some changes since April in an ever-changing environment. Some other information has come in. And again, we're asking him to help us assess where things are and where things may be going. Um, for all of us in our roles as sponsor programs, administrators, and other managers in higher ed, how to anticipate and plan for the future. Matt, can I hand it over to you, please? Uh, yes, you can. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that intro. Uh, hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, so I am going to attempt to share my slideshow. Okay, is that? You got it. Okay, right on. Uh, so I've been asked, um, as you heard, I've been asked to uh, provide a, uh, uh, an update and outlook on where uh, federal science funding uh, may, may, uh, may be headed. Uh, here in the next uh, uh, year and beyond. Um, and I think if you really want to understand um, where, where research funding is going, um, oh, there we go. Um, uh, often research, uh, research dollars are often um, a function of the bigger picture. So starting with the bigger picture, I think, is a pretty good place to, uh, um, uh, to begin. Um, and when I talk about the big picture, I mean specifically uh, the part of the budget that's known as discretionary spending. Uh, discretionary spending is the part of the federal budget that's allocated annually uh, through the appropriations process. And in this graph, this is the, a graph of the, uh, the entire federal budget. Uh, discretionary spending are the red and the blue slices. So it's about one third of, of all federal outlays these days. It used to be a much larger slice of the pie, uh, but it's, it's, it's shrunk relative to the rest of the budget. Uh, in, uh, in recent decades. Uh, and discretionary spending, it's important, it's relevant uh, for us because it's, um, it's the home of just about all federal research spending. So uh, the National Science Foundation, NIH, NASA, the, Ener uh, the Energy Department, they're all, part, they're all contained within the discretionary budget. And one of the weird quirks of our system is that um, R&D doesn't tend to change a whole lot as a share of the discretionary budget. So, um, so as, uh, since about 1980 or so, uh, as discretionary spending goes, so goes R&D for the most part. Um, now, discretionary spending has been capped for most of the past decade. Um, uh, and that was, it was capped um, under, the, uh, under the terms of the Budget Control Act, uh, which was passed in 2011. Under the Budget Control Act, uh, discretionary spending um, uh, was scheduled to decline uh, dramatically in uh, starting in 2013 uh, through a mechanism uh, known as sequestration. Um, can you actually see my 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 mouse my cursor? Yeah. Okay. Cool. So I can 
did not know that. So, uh, so under the Budget Control Act, um, uh, spending was uh, scheduled to decline by about eight to ten percent for both defense and non-defense programs uh, in 2013. This chart, this chart only shows non-defense programs, but uh, same story for defense spending. Hard to show you that. Um, uh, so we'd have these big, you know, eight to ten percent across the board program cuts uh, for discretionary spending in 2013. Uh, and then um, steady growth somewhat ahead of the rate of inflation um, uh, from this lower baseline from 2013 through 2021 when the spending caps expire. Uh, and the whole point of this, this legislation was to reduce discretionary spending, reduce deficits. Uh, and under the terms of this law, uh, it would have meant uh, uh, over a trillion dollars less for uh, indiscretionary spending over this time period which in turn would, would have meant uh, tens of billions of dollars less for research spending uh, over this time. And naturally, when Congress adopted this law way back in 2011, uh, it was um, immediately uh, cause for uh, major concern uh, from the, uh, the DC research community and other folks uh, who rely on the discretionary budget. Um, now, fortunately for science, um, Almost immediately, as soon as Congress adopted this law in 2011 to cut spending, uh, they immediately began trying to find ways around it. Uh, and so what they've done in the years since then is they've um, added every year um, at least tens of billion dollars back into the discretionary budget. Um, uh, and this has meant uh, extra spending for NIH, for NSF, and other research programs than they may have received otherwise. Uh, and this most notably, uh, um, uh, resulted in uh, big increases in discretionary spending in 2018 uh, and then 2019. And you can see kind of in the earlier years of this decade, we've had some increases in, in discretionary spending and this has made a difference, has meant, you know, additional research dollars available. But then in 2018, Congress kind of went, they blew way beyond where they, uh, where they may have, uh, you know, where, where they had been going previously, added, um, uh, about 150, 160 billion dollars total in the, in the discretionary budget for 2018, then another big increase in 2019. Uh, and these changes, and especially the, the increase in 2018, meant that the uh, 2019 fiscal year uh, saw the largest growth in about a decade and a half for research programs. So we had about a 15% increase in the basic science office uh, in the Department of Energy. We had about a $3 billion increase for NIH, and other programs saw big. Uh, big increases as well. Um, and it's kind of interesting. I mean, these, these years, 2018 and 2019, um, you know, really generous spending. And there's, there's been this still, I think, this, this idea that uh, in these, these years, um, uh, this, this notion, in these, year, in these years under the Trump administration, uh, we've had some pretty massive spending cuts. And it's true, the Trump administration has tried to dramatically scale back federal research dollars, but the reality of it has been uh, uh, the exact opposite. And we've had some pretty dramatic growth uh, in, in, in these past few years um, because of Congress kind of riding to the rescue, avoiding the big uh, spending cuts we may have gotten and instead adding money back into the budget. Now, the, the, the trick coming into this year uh, uh, in which Congress is debating the 2020 fiscal year spending cycle is that the most recent budget deal, which affected 2018 and 2019, uh, was scheduled to expire. And starting in 2020, we were looking at another round of these across the board spending cuts of about 10%. Uh, so you can imagine what a reduction of, uh, you know, 10% out of the NIH budget, 10% uh, reduction to the NASA budget and other agencies you may care about, uh, what that uh, may have meant uh, for, for science programs. Um, this was a major point of concern for both Democrats and Republicans alike, albeit for, for some different reasons. Um, and so one of the questions coming into this fiscal year, uh, this, uh, this appropriation cycle, is what does Congress do with, uh, with, this, with this situation? Do they allow these, these spending cuts to happen? Do they mitigate them somewhat? Do they increase spending? Uh, well, into that debate, we've had um, incredibly divergent proposals. Um, First, earlier this year, back in March, uh, we had uh, President Trump's latest budget request uh, for the 2020 fiscal year. That's the orange dotted line here. Uh, and for non-defense spending, and non-defense spending is again where NIH and, and most other research programs live, um, the Trump administration embraced these big spending cuts. They, they went along with these 10% cuts to non-defense spending, and then would continue cutting non-defense spending uh, uh, 
well into the future, which, you know, this kind of a trend line would mean, you know, basically catastrophic reductions to most federal research programs. Um, and the Trump administration's budget request agency by agency was correspondingly um, uh, uh, pretty tough as it has been in years past. You know, not, not the first, this is not the first time we've seen, we would have seen big cuts to science agencies. Uh, conversely, um, House Democrats on the Appropriations Committee uh, adopted uh, uh, a very different strategy. Um, they simply assumed, uh, or in, in, the, in the legislative parlance, they deemed a, a over, an overall discretionary spending target uh, of about 5% above 2019 levels. Uh, so that's this short line here. Um, and this uh, moderate increase in discretionary spending uh, meant that the, the House numbers uh, uh, were uh, dramatically different from, uh, from the, White House, uh, the White House budget request. Um, and a again, this is you know, not the first time we've seen this, this, this kind of a distinction between the White House and, and Congress. And again, the White House, this is simply percentage uh, changes year over year proposed by the White House in the orange and then uh, adopted in the House uh, in the blue. Um, uh, and you can see some, uh, you know, some of the, the big differences between the White House and the House. Uh, from the White House perspective, uh, their budget, again, echoed uh, their past budget requests. And it's been, uh, been very similar, really. I mean, it's, they, they've got, uh, this White House has issued three uh, full budget requests. Um, and, uh, and they've all been, been very similar. Uh, in particular, this, uh, this White House has been very interested in trying to cut back uh, energy technology, R&D programs, um, climate research, environmental research, uh, uh, as well as other programs. But they've also uh, gone after basic science funded by NIST, NSF, NIH, as you can see. Uh, then again, as you can see, the House has almost across the board said, uh, thanks, but no thanks. Uh, uh, and instead of going along with these cuts, they, they've adopted some, uh, some moderate to, in some cases, sizable uh, increases for science programs. Um, uh, and just to, to I'll, I'll try to, to, to go quick here. I do want to get into um, uh, a little bit of detail, um, uh, agency by agency, uh, for, for some of the larger uh, research funders. And, and if people have uh, uh, questions or want additional detail, uh, feel free to, to, to ask. Um, uh, or on our website, you get a lot more information. Uh, but just to start with some of the big ones, uh, starting with NIH, uh, in the House, again, we, uh, we have seen uh, another $2 billion increase for NIH, about a 5% increase uh, above 2019 levels. Um, and that would be, uh, if those numbers were to hold up, that would represent the fifth year in a row uh, that we've gotten uh, increases of uh, at least $2 billion for NIH. So it's been, you know, after close to a decade of, uh, of stagnation for NIH. Uh, we have had some, um, uh, uh, some pretty uh, notable congressional generosity uh, in the past five years. Uh, within NIH, just about every individual institute would receive increases of about 5%, um, with some, some variation, some larger, some a little bit smaller. Um, precision medicine and Alzheimer's research continue to be uh, major uh, priorities for the Congress. Uh, Alzheimer's would rise, uh, overall funding would rise to about 2.4 billion. Uh, and again, that uh, would continue several years of increased funding for Alzheimer's research. Uh, precision medicine funding would, would reach about 500 million. Uh, in addition, we'd get some uh, new money for new initiatives in, uh, on uh, uh, pediatric cancer, uh, which would receive about 50 million. Uh, gun violence research and extramural R&D facilities would both see uh, uh, a new funding of $25 million each. Uh, in addition to that $25 million for NIH on gun violence research, we'd also get $25 million uh, uh, on, on the same, uh, same topic uh, for, uh, for CDC uh, in, the, in house legislation. Uh, at the Defense Department, we'd see some pretty major cuts for science and tech programs overall, although basic science, which is probably the most relevant uh, for you all uh, and for universities in general would be about flat in the House bill. Uh, we'd see increases for uh, uh, Army basic science. Uh, you can see university research initiatives uh, listed there, about a 7% increase. Um, several kind of, you know, continuing priorities include hypersonics, cybersecurity, uh, AI. Um, DARPA would get about a 3% increase in the House legislation. Uh, good numbers for NSF, about a 7% uh, increase for NSF in the House bill. Uh, would end up, uh, NSF would end up at about $8.6 billion total. Um, also good numbers uh, for the Department of Energy. 
uh, starting with the Office of Science, which is the big basic science funder. Uh, the office would reach about $7 billion under these numbers, uh, increases of just over 4%. Um, Congress continues to support uh, computer science, uh, math research, uh, exascale computing, um, uh, education programs, especially for undergrads. Um, on the fusion research front, we'd see um, increases for domestic programs uh, as well, but uh, the big increase there would be uh, ITER funding, that's the International Fusion Energy Project, uh, which would see a near doubling. Um, and the, en the Energy Frontier Research Center's program, I'm not sure if uh, SUNY has hosted any of these in the past, they may have, uh, and if not, you know, perhaps they, they, they could in the future. Uh, but um, but they, uh, the Energy Frontier Research Center's program would receive a 9% increase uh, for, um, in, uh, in the 2020 fiscal year under the House bill, uh, and there would be a new round of funding in, uh, in, uh, uh, in the 2020 fiscal year. Uh, on the DOE technology front, we'd see big increases of at least 11% for uh, uh, renewable energy R&D, efficiency R&D. Uh, ARPA-E, that's the Advanced Research Projects Agency Energy, they fund uh, high-risk, high-reward research. Uh, they've been a, a, bit of a, a bit of a political football uh, in, in, uh, in recent years. Um, uh, but, you know, the Congress has, has uh, protected them and, and has uh, achieved some plus-ups in, uh, in recent years. Uh, grid security, reliability, et cetera, um, uh, would see some increases. Uh, and then USDA uh, would do well uh, in the House bill, especially for uh, competitive extramural grants. Uh, under the Agriculture and Food Research Initiative, uh, received, it would receive about a 12% increase uh, or a $50 million increase uh, above FY 2019 levels. So that, again, continues some pretty dramatic growth that program has seen in recent years. Uh, other USDA research programs would do, you know, would do, would do all right. Um, <clears throat> one of the big controversies for USDA has been uh, the Trump administration's efforts to move uh, the National Institute of Food and Agriculture, as well as the uh, Economic Research Service out of DC. Um, this has prompted mass resignations on the part of uh, USDA staff within those agencies. It's uh, prompted some pretty major outcry from um, uh, the advocacy community here in DC. And in the latest kind of development, uh, USDA is moving ahead with this move, which the USDA uh, Inspector General has said may actually break the law because Congress has not provided funding uh, for this move in recent uh, appropriations bills, um, and USDA did not provide some sufficient warning and some other, some other factors uh, in play here. But so that's kind of an interesting, uh, interesting um, debate, continues to be a major, uh, major point of controversy, and we'll see where it, where it goes. Um, it appears that this move is continuing to, 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 to proceed. Uh, we'll see if the House uh, files suit, or you know what what may happen uh, uh, on that front. It's still uh, still kind of a a, a controversy uh, um, uh, uh, underway. Um, and just a few other notes. I mean, I'm not going to get any great detail. Uh, NASA would see some increases for uh, their science programs. Uh, the energy, the education office at NASA would uh, be spared from elimination, as would space grant, as would uh, C grant funded by NOAA. Um, other Environmental research programs would be fine. They would dodge uh, some of the big recommended cuts by the White House. Uh, in some cases, we'd see some pretty, we'd see some pretty major plus ups, including research programs for NOAA, uh, for uh, coastal research, um, ocean, Great Lakes research, climate research, et cetera. Uh, USGS would see some big increases. Uh, and then I mentioned CDC uh, would see close to a billion dollar increase, and we'd see increases for uh, veterans related research, uh, NIST labs, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so again, coming out of the House, and, and the House has made really good progress on their spending legislation. Um, the, the full House has adopted, I believe, 10 out of 12 spending bills. Uh, so, you know, how, things are looking good in the, coming out of the House. Uh, the caveat to all this, unfortunately, is that it doesn't really matter exactly what the House does. It, what, it matters what Congress does. Uh, and Congress as a whole has yet um, to adopt anything regarding uh, science spending. What they have done is reach uh, an overall spending deal to uh, avoid that big spending drop that I mentioned uh, and raise the spending caps uh, for 20, 2020 and 2021. Uh, that's the good news. The not quite so good news is that uh, they actually ended up going with about $15 billion less than the House uh, had recommended. So uh, all of these, those numbers I just ran through, um, some of them may hold up, but many of them may not. 
so the issue now is how does Congress fit these overall spending increases into a slightly larger uh, bucket than they thought, than the House had been working. Um, so that's kind of where we are now. This, this spending bill that they just adopted, this uh, became law just uh, uh, not even a month ago. Um, uh, and, so, uh, and so in terms of where we are now, they've got this spending deal in hand. They know that they've got spending caps in place. It has been signed into law. Um, they can avoid this big 10% across the board spending cut that, uh, that was, you know, kind of moving, uh, 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 you know, moving, moving down the pipe. Um, uh, unfortunately, the Senate, they're, they're pretty far uh, behind where one might have expected them to be in any other year, in kind of a more normal year. Um, you know, typically the House and the Senate are working on their spending legislation in June and July. Um, the House, as I you know, just ran through, uh, has made really good progress. The Senate has issued nothing so far. Uh, so their plan, as of right now, they come back, uh, they come back, they're on August recess right now, they come back uh, starting September 9th, uh, and their plan is to turn through as many uh, spending bills as they can in rapid order uh, in September and perhaps beyond. Um, the, you know, one of the, while they're, they're behind and we're lo probably looking at a continuing resolution, uh, uh, well, you know, into October and, and, and likely beyond. Um, the good news from the Senate perspective is that there have been some some real uh, champions for research spending uh, in the Senate uh, in, in recent years. People like Roy Blunt, uh, who chairs the NIH subcommittee, um, uh, Lamar Alexander, who chairs the Energy Department uh, subcommittee, uh, Dick Durbin, who's been a big supporter of defense research programs, and he's the, uh, the, uh, the ranking member uh, in the defense subcommittee and many others as well. There's a pretty long list of um, research supporters in the Senate. So there's no reason to expect, given you know, the Senate uh, and, and the Congress has about a 3% increase in the spending caps to work with between 2019 and 2020, um, there isn't really any reason to expect anything but, but pretty positive numbers uh, coming out of the Senate for, uh, for the big uh, funders of university research and extramural research. Um, even if they've got to end up scaling back some of the House numbers, uh, as, I, as I mentioned. Um, you know, there's a lot that Congress can do with about a three, three and a half percent increase in the spending caps uh, in 2020. Um, uh, and in fact, that, you know, that it may end up looking a lot like um, what we had in 2016 and 2017. So this chart simply shows you uh, relative changes in discretionary spending going back to 2010. Um, I've got some of the major uh, research programs um, shown as well. And again, these are all relative changes. Uh, so I've got NIH, uh, DOE, NSF, et cetera. And the current spending uh, situation, uh, it looks a lot like the 2016 and 2017 uh, fiscal year. In that year, they adopted a spending deal that raised the spending caps by about, again, it was about a 4% increase that year. So a little bit less generous this time around. Uh, and that year, you can see what happened with NIH, with NASA, uh, uh, the Department of Energy, et cetera. We, we did have some, some fairly moderate increases on the order of 4, 5, 6% uh, for these agencies uh, that year. Um, and that could be what we're looking at this time around as well for the 2020 fiscal year. The challenge for, uh, uh, for this go-around is the same as we had in 2017. While Congress did enact a, about a 3% increase for discretionary spending in 2020, uh, spending is going to be um, nominal spending is flat in 2021, which means when you factor in inflation, you could be looking at a, a real dollar decline. Uh, and again, we had something similar, uh, uh, similar scenario in 2016, 2017. Uh, that year in 2017, we had flat spending between 2016, 2017. Um, uh, factoring in inflation, it meant an actual real dollar decline. And we did have uh, some agencies that didn't do quite so well, a lot of flat funding, some spending reductions in 2017. So the real kind of point of concern, I think, is not so much uh, the 2020 fiscal year, um, but uh, what happens next year, 2021, we've got election year uh, and, you know, a very limited fiscal room. Um, so, but returning to the, the current year in 2020, so uh, what we expect will happen is uh, the Senate will churn through their legislation in September, perhaps into October. Uh, once they've done that, um, they've got to start um, negotiating with the House to produce a final set of conference numbers. Uh, we expect that will go very, could go very quickly for most agencies. There are some outstanding issues. Um, uh, uh, you know, we do have this issue of the border wall that's been hanging out there. 
Uh, we don't know how much of a hard line the Trump administration is going to hold on that issue. Uh, uh, and, you know, and, and, and similarly, how much of a hard line House Democrats are going to are going to hold on that issue. Um, uh, Richard Shelby, the chair of the uh, Appropriations Committee in the Senate, has already said he's moved some some funding over from the health spending bill, which funds NIH and other uh, research programs and non research programs. He's moved some funding older from there over uh, to the uh, Homeland Security bill, I believe, to fund the border wall. Um, that's a non-starter for a lot of House Democrats. So that could be a big issue. In addition, we've got this gun violence research issue. Uh, House Democrats want to put in specific line item funding for that, uh, whereas the Senate Republicans have argued that um, it doesn't need its own line item. Uh, these agencies can fund this if they want to. We want to give them greater flexibility to, to fund that or not. Um, so that could be an issue as well. And these two issues, the border wall and gun violence research, um, they could end up slowing down proceedings on the two biggest spending bills funding the Department of Defense and funding the Department of Health and Human Services, which which is responsible for or is the home for NIH and CDC uh, and other other programs as well. So we'll see what happens there. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Congress has done a really good job, at least the House so far and the Senate will likely do a really good job of keeping the decks clear uh, regarding the typical kind of problematic, challenging uh, policy writers that often slow down other legislation. Um, so the Commerce Justice Science Bill, the Interior Bill, uh, this is legislation that funds EPA, the National Science Foundation, NASA, NOAA, uh, the Energy Department, um, all of these could move pretty quickly. Um, and so we may end up, we're almost certainly going to need a continuing resolution uh, for uh, at least some or all of these agencies. But it's possible that we could see final spending for some of the more non-controversial agencies like NSF, et cetera, uh, much more quickly. Um, and then, you know, who's to say how, how long the NIH defense uh, debate may last? It could go into November, December. It's very hard to predict. Uh, you know, if one is optimistic, one may hope they can finalize all this, let's say, in, you know, late October or sometime in November. But it, it, could, take, uh, it could take longer. Uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, and then beyond this year, which, again, if they can sort out these issues, I think should be a moderately good year for research spending. Uh, I already talked about next year could be uh, we could be looking at a very limited year um, with a less than one percent increase for defense and non-defense discretionary spending. It's going to limit the room uh, that Congress is going to have to allocate funding for research. Um, we've also got an election year, and the last couple of major uh, you know presidential election cycles uh, have been um, uh, 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 fairly eventful, one might say, regarding uh, um, appropriations timing. Um, you know, it's open, open question whether Congress can get spending done on time next year or if they have to punt it uh, into late fall after the election or even into the, the beginning of the, the final year. So, um, you, know, uh, you know, we may or may not be looking at a pretty long term uh, um, continuing resolution uh, for the next fiscal year uh, starting next fall. Uh, then the, the spending caps do expire finally um, starting in the, um, in the 2021 fiscal year. So this is the um, 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 you know, the, 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 this will be the, for the appropriations debate after the, um, uh, I'm sorry, spending caps expire for the 2022 fiscal year. So that is the 2021 spending debate. So we're still a couple of years away from that, but um, that will be one less thing Congress has to worry about, you know, may make things a little bit easier uh, in the future, uh, uh, in the long run. Uh, but in the very long run, we still have uh, some major issues uh, that, that uh, the, the nation is dealing with. Um, in particular, we're looking at uh, continued increasing uh, um, uh, healthcare costs and an aging population. Uh, in the long run, we are looking at uh, declining uh, relative discretionary spending uh, in the long term. That's what this, these graphics are from the Congressional Budget Office, and, and they kind of lay out some of these changes. Uh, in the very long term, um, you know, if discretionary spending continues to decline relative to the rest of the budget, relative to Social Security, to Medicare, Medicaid. Uh, we're probably looking at, uh, we may be looking at uh, fairly stagnant research spending from the federal government uh, over the next, uh, you know, few decades, uh, 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 which is, uh, continues to be a major issue and, and, you know, is certainly a point of concern, long-term concern uh, for the research community. Um, so I will, uh, I'll wrap up there. The last, maybe the last thing I'll say since I've got you, uh, we do have a lot more information on our website. Um, one of the things we've been doing lately is uh, uh, interactive dashboards using Tableau um, that let you very easily uh, uh, and in real time see how different science agencies are faring. Um, 
uh, uh, you know, by agency, by program, et cetera. So if you want to see what is happening with, uh, you know, with say basic energy sciences at DOE or with, uh, you know, the planetary science program at NASA or whatever, you can, you can come to our website uh, following that link, triplas.org slash RD, uh, pretty easily find these, uh, these interactive dashboards. People seem to find them uh, uh, pretty, um, uh, pretty helpful tools. So um, I'll wrap up there. Um, and uh, happy to take uh, uh, any questions, uh, uh, um, uh, questions or comments, uh, uh, if I can clarify, uh, if we have time. Okay, so it does look like we have um, a question here um, from Lori and Charlene. Can you tell me where you said in Department of State fall? I don't know if they want to um, unmute their line to clarify, but that's the question. Yeah, so you well, so I can just generally just kind of say, I mean, USAID, I mean, the Trump administration has, like many other uh, federal agencies, the Trump administration uh, has been very interested in cutting back those budgets. Um, you know, Congress has not gone, gone along with those changes either. I'm not sure how uh, USAID fared in the House uh, legislation. I know that Lindsey Graham uh, is one of many in the Senate who values um, uh, you know, USAID and foreign aid in general. Um, the Trump administration, I should say, Ed is also very interested in not just scaling back funding in the next fiscal year, but in rescinding past funding uh, that was provided for those programs. Um, but, you know, they, 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 um, they do have their supporters in Congress. I mean, I would expect, uh, um, again, things will turn out, uh, uh, you know, moderately positive uh, for those programs as well uh, uh, this year. They are, they are um, I should add, housed in the discretionary budget like other, uh, other programs. So, um, you know, again, you know, they, they, they tend to fare uh, similar to other research programs when there is an increase in discretionary spending, their budgets tend to be fine, so. Great. And I see something, oh, another comment here, uh, looks as if spending is at or near era levels of 2010, and yes, that's true. Um, for, you know, it's we, I mean, the way to think about research spending over the past decade is that it, you know, after uh, era, after 2010, um, uh, you know, we had the, the, the Tea Party wave election, and that's when spending really began to come down, uh, you know, and there was a big crater for several years. But Congress has been doing a, um, um, a pretty remarkable job, frankly, the past, you know, say, say five years or so, in restoring a lot of the cuts that we saw. And, and yes, so for, for agencies like NIH, uh, the Department of Energy and others, um, you know, they're back to where they would have been, or uh, back to where they were uh, in, uh, in 2010. Um, you know, and we'll see if that that trend uh, continues. But uh, it's been uh, been very positive. Uh, a lot of very positive funding outcomes for research uh, in, in, uh, in recent years. So. Great. Uh, this is Scott. Thank you, Matt. And we're going to open it up. And uh, again, we've got um, Amy Herstack and Matt Morose. As folks recall from a number of um, talks to our symposium or to the system, the chancellor is looking to substantially grow research activity to tackle some major issues. And as Matt's data shows us, um, we can't rely on federal funding to be the 70 or 80 percent of our funding sources for that growth. So um, I've asked Amy and Matt to um, join Matt uh, to talk about different or novel uh, partnerships with industry sponsors or other sponsors to build on and leverage our substantial core of federal funding. Um, and I don't know if um, who wants to maybe lead off with a comment or? Sure, I'll start, Amy, if you don't mind. Um, Eamon and I, over the years, have worked on many, many collaborative initiatives, just the collaborative initiatives to support, um, you know, better ways of working with industry and making sure that our, the RF's administrative infrastructure actually supports uh, the climate that Scott had uh, recently described. So this is probably the third or fourth time I've heard Matt speak and it's always a sobering discussion, um, but it's also, <laughs> it's also a comforting discussion too, because maybe what we're hearing in the media is about the federal funding situation isn't as, um, doesn't isn't as detrimental as many of those in the media make us think, because it seems like um, federal funding is gonna remain relatively stagnant, and from a strategic perspective, SUNY wants to increase its research capacity, so, while we may be able to maintain our federal our federal funds, I think if we're going to grow, we have to target 
other types of sponsors, even beyond, beyond federal, beyond state, but look to make more collaborative partnerships with industry. Um, and I just, I know everybody is aware, aware of this, but I'll probably be a dead horse. But just so you know, um, five, you know, a, a multi-year project was to modify and reform SUNY's patent and inventions policy, which um, really dictates how we can work with sponsors and what happens to that intellectual property that's created through the work of a sponsor, how ownership is determined between um, an industry sponsor, let's say, and the research foundation. And I guess we had our crystal ball five years ago when we were redrafting and reforming that that patent policy because um, now um, it's very flexible. It's a very flexible model. It's a very flexible um, piece of our administrative infrastructure to support our work because it enables us to enter into engagements with industry that we would never be able to before. So it removes the barriers of our facilities-based policy where all IP created within um, SUNY facilities was owned by the university. Now we have the option, so long as we're working on certain parameters um, to allow our industry partners and sponsors to have ownership to IP, which um, you know, was a much more modernized way of working with industry. And um, I think it has proven to be pretty successful recently with the announcement of two rather large industrial partnerships, one with Applied Materials through the SUNY Applied Materials Research Institute, and another one focusing on artificial intelligence which with IBM. So together with those two partners, we've created system-wide uh, research collaborations that are available to faculty members across the entire SUNY enterprise. And just to build on that comment, Matt, um, you know, the, what, the word that comes to mind, and, and you even said it, was flexibility in working with industry. Um, that patent and invention policy really does allow us to meet companies where they are. Um, most of most industry sponsors want certainty when they're coming in to do a research project with us. They want to know that um, they're either going to have an exclusive license opportunity or there's going to be no IP coming out of it. And um, because we have a lot of flexibility, we can address that up front. We can do that with the SWIFT um, uh, licensing terms where companies can pay an upfront fee and then they have an exclusive license with a royalty holiday um, in the event that they commercialize the technology that they're licensing. And um, we have actually used, taken that approach on, on some sp other specific projects where we don't really think there's going to be anything licensable coming out of it, but um, they still want to have that exclusivity piece. So we say, okay, here's an upfront, you know, we'll charge you an upfront fee for an exclusive license to something that we probably will never see in the marketplace. But, but at least you know it's going to be yours. And, and I think that that's something that industry really appreciates, um, at least when they're coming to us to do their initial research. And, um, and then further to that, I think every project that we do, um, there have been so many that are, they start out as maybe a small testing agreement and um, it is very simple. It's actually critical it's a, because it's a relationship building um, process. So once we start with one thing, um, then they come back and then they come back again and then it's a much larger project. Um, and we actually just signed uh, a big agreement with uh, a much more seasoned, uh, much um, like a, a publicly traded company that we normally wouldn't have been able to get to that point, but it, it took a long time. We had to build the relationship and, and now here we are and we're looking to them to, I think, bring even more industries, you know, more developed companies to us just because we're doing work with them. Yeah, so I say, I mean, what I think it means for us as research administrators uh, and professionals is the agility to support faculty who have a couple, say, large NIH awards, maybe a couple clinical trials, maybe something else in, in the cell. I, I mean, it, 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 it's thinking outside the box and thinking outside the standard sort of 
RFP response and project management timeline, where we're engaging on a number of fronts to help fund and facilitate the researchers' overarching research agenda in their particular field. Um, I don't know, Jeff, if there's anything um, that you wanted to comment. Well, it's also the other challenge is going to be that in shifting from where faculty are used to working in an environment where it's promoting basic research and you're working with traditional um, federal sponsors, if we are going to make a push to work more with industry, there is, and I know that Matt and the tech transfer directors are well aware of this, we've got to also educate the faculty because if you think about it, uh, having been a former faculty member myself, you're conditioned to making sure that whoever you're talking to understands you're the expert in the field and you're the best and brightest and you're going to prove that by putting your ideas out there and explaining exactly why you are the, you know, the expert in the field. Unfortunately, that does not translate well when working with potential industry sponsors because you give away the job and they say, well, thank you very much, we'll call you. So there is an educational component that we're going to need to take on, but I do believe that they're making that effort. And I'm seeing some progress, for example, with the uh, latest DOD day where we've done this twice now where SUNY is being strategic and saying that DOD program managers have far greater latitude and discretion to make funding decisions compared to their counterparts at NIH and MSF. So strategically we're trying to pair the correct SUNY faculty with the right expertise with program officers. And the first year, I had to sit the second, this was the second year back in June, I believe it was now. And so the second time I had to sit next to one of the program officers from one of the uh, defense agencies. And he said, well, the first go round, uh, we, we had these speed dating arrangements where faculty have five minutes basically to meet with a program officer and make a pitch. He said, well, the first go round is basically them talking for four minutes and then me trying to get a word in edgewise in the last minute. And so also, working with the faculty to say, you really need to take more of an approach to say, what problem is it you're trying to solve? And here's how I can help contribute towards that. So I think that there is, if we are truly going to double the research enterprise as the faculty, as, as the chancellor has envisioned, that means that every institution is going to have to increase its market share, especially given Matt Herhan's presentation where we're looking at flat budgets at best and the losses due to inflation. It's really a matter of how do we become more competitive in those arenas. Um, and one thing I'll know, Bay sets is a very good point, Jeff, about the shifting the culture of faculty working with maybe company proprietary data is for folks who out there you who are directly supporting faculty research areas who may be responding to uh, call for proposals coming out from either the IBM partnership or the Applied Materials Partnership, there will be some education on company con company confidential information and just helping your faculty to get used to working in that environment where you're not sharing everything around the water cooler um, or, 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 you know, it's just, and, and I've worked with a number of very successful faculty over the years, whether it's SUNY or other universities where I've worked. And after a very short amount of time, faculty are quite adept at adjusting, you know, the company proprietary stuff goes into this silo in their head and the, the federal funding discussions on this silo. And um, it, it, it's, it's one, an adjustment that's usually made pretty quickly. So Matt Herhan in, 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 in Washington, I don't know if you have any, um, having listened to a couple folks on our end, if you have any thoughts um, from the budgetary perspective or just your years of analyzing data in, in relation to research funding. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think it's certainly uh, the right instinct to, to, to you know, to, to feel that you have to um, diversify. I mean, there, there are going to be limits. The issue, the issue with federal spending, you know, is not that it's in the long run, anyway, not necessarily that it's going to shrink, um, but that it's not going to grow, um, most likely it isn't going to grow sufficiently enough to meet demand, um, you know, on the, on the part of performers um, like yourselves. Um, you know, I guess the one thing I would say, I mean, there's, there are some areas that do seem to grow a little better than others. Um, you know, over the very long term, um, some of the big university funders like NIH, the National Science Foundation, uh, and the Department of Energy, um, all three of those have actually grown relative to the rest of the discretionary budget. Um, they're, they're uh, and especially, at least NIH, and I don't know if this is true of BOE as well, but at least NIH and NSF are about double 
um, their, their share of the discretionary budget is about double today what it was uh, in 1980. So, you know, I think it's, you know, I, I sort of, you know, w would suggest that on the one hand, yes, it, 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 there are going to be limits to how, to the availability of federal research dollars uh, in the future. On the other hand, there are areas, you know, life sciences research uh, certainly se continues to be, I think, a major congressional priority, um, you know, for obvious reasons. I mean, everybody, you know, there isn't a, uh, a district, uh, a congressional district in America in which, uh, you know, every voter is in perfect health. Um, so life sciences research will, will continue to be, um, you know, a point of interest. Um, and even beyond the life sciences, I mean, the, 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 the fact that we are facing uh, increased competitiveness pressure from China, uh, you know, all the metrics are, are looking increasingly scary uh, uh, in terms of uh, spending, you know, patenting, uh, you know, publications. Um, uh, you know, the, the, there is the, 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 those factors do uh, have been motivating Congress to try to take another look at the research budget and find ways to increase it. Um, it's possible that what we're going to see uh, in the coming years um, is an, uh, 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 what you might call an increasingly strategic um, funding environment from the Congress where, you know, maybe we don't quite see kind of these general broad based increases for an entire agency. Um, but what we might see instead are um, sustained, um, you know, long-term funding initiatives where, you know, within a given agency, maybe a particular area gets favored. Uh, and that's where the funding goes for a while. For, ans for instance, you know, in, in, the, uh, in the Department of Energy recently, I mean, there's been a major focus on advanced computing, uh, on exascale computing. Um, and that's, that part of the budget has grown much more rapidly than, than other parts uh, of the budget. Um, you know, again, I mentioned earlier with an NIH, Alzheimer's research has, has gotten a lot of attention lately. Um, you know, we've had the cancer moonshot, things like that. So, I mean, I, you know, it, the, 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 the role and prominence that those kinds of initiatives play within federal agency budgets, um, you know, that, that may increase uh, in the years ahead as dollars in general become uh, uh, more difficult. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind. The other thing to keep in mind is that, you know, the spending caps are expiring uh, in a year or two. Um, we do have, in the long run, we are going to have this eroding fiscal situation, you know, trillion dollar deficits. And, um, you know, I mean, that the, these major issues, the big issues that have, you know, prompted some of the Tea Party fiscal backlash that prompted the spending caps that are in place now, um, these issues aren't going away. Um, and so it's entirely possible that once the caps expire, that may open the door, you know, perhaps in the, in the, in the you know, year or two or three after that, um, that may open the door to another one of these attempts at kind of coming up with a fiscal reckoning um, to get our, you know, our, our federal fiscal house in order, um, uh, constrain growth and mandatory spending, get our revenues under control, get deficits under control. Um, this is probably a long shot and probably wishful thinking on my part, but if Congress, let's say five years from now, is able to put together some kind of a bipartisan, you know, grand bargain strategy plan, what have you, um, that does get our fiscal house in order, that's the kind of thing that actually could open the door for increased investment in, in research dollars. Um, because, you know, basic science and university research is one of the few areas that, that Congress really does seem to get on a bipartisan basis, um, you know, Democrats and Republicans alike, I mean, are, uh, are, have been champions for basic science, for research dollars, et cetera. Um, and often if Congress, you know, is, I mean, this, the, this eroding research funding environment, it's not a product really of what Congress thinks of basic science. It's a product of what Congress thinks about everything else and how much they like spending on everything else. Um, so if Congress, you know, can, let's say again, and in five years or 10 years or whatever, uh, can get their fiscal house in order, that could open the door for much better outcomes for, for research. Uh, but that is, you know, needless to say, that's no small, no small task. Um, Cause it would require doing things that, you know, doing some things that everybody uh, hates, like cutting back on mandatory spending, increasing revenues, uh, you know, so, um, so that's the other thing to kind of keep in mind. It's one reason why it's worth keeping an eye on the, the, the bigger, fiscal picture here and why I often focus on the bigger fiscal picture because 
you know, dealing with those issues uh, could mean good things for research. But short of that, again, it, you know, it, it may end up being a much more strategic environment in the next decade, let's say, where as issues emerge, uh, as China takes the lead in certain areas, you know, pick a, you know, pick a, pick a discipline, you know, material science or photonics or, um, you know, any, any number of, of areas. As China or other countries seem to move ahead, that may be incentive for Congress to throw money to those um, specific areas. So keeping an eye on, on emerging topics, emerging uh, areas of, of um, strategic interest may be, may be of interest uh, and may be of value, so. Great, well, thank you. I just have a follow-up, uh, Matt. You made me think about it. you're correct in that while we may talk about the overall federal budget being stagnant, not increasing until Congress is the House in order, your point about looking at what has happened with some of the major funders and how the baseline has shifted tremendously is important. I think that in addition to what you're saying, that as China becomes more competitive, unfortunately, we tend to we act out of fear and our federal priorities here. And so I think that you know, eventually we will have another presidential administration. There will be different parties in power in Congress. Priorities will shift. And I think there will also be factors such as recognition of the perils of climate change, et cetera. So if you're correct in that, we will probably see a shift in priorities and money being made available where it previously may not be at, at, at current levels. So the point's well taken. Thank you. Thank you again to our panel, Matt Hurahan, Amy Herstack, and Matt Morose. And I'll hand the program back over to Kathleen and Jane. Okay, thanks, Scott. Um, before we let our fine speakers leave um, and we proceed with the graduation, is there any other question that anybody has for Matt, Matt, Amy, or Jeff, or comments? Do you see anything in the chat feature, Julia? Okay, well, once again, we thank you all for participating. This was a great session and it's been recorded, so we'll be able to continue using it for other learning and development opportunities. Thank you again, Jeff, Matt, Matt, and Amy. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. We're just gonna go back to those slides um, that we started with, but we're not going to use the music. And I actually uh, know a couple of our folks here have got to leave um, before 2.30. So our next exercise is actually a reflective piece, which we'd like you to tell us something you've learned and how you're going to apply it to your job. So while we're getting that PowerPoint back up, um, Marissa, with all of the, thank you. While we're doing that, I do have to just say, if it weren't for Scott Shirtlip, we wouldn't have had that great program. So, well, wonderful job. I, 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 I meant to thank you earlier. So. Well, I, I, I would have Matt her hand speak quarterly to keep us up to speed on what's happening in DC. He's so good, yeah. So many changes. Yeah, so anyway, thank you. Thank you. Um, why, yeah, let's go, let's go to that second one where we've got Jessica Burke's uh, name. So again, what I'd like folks to do would be to, um, we sort of gave you an assignment. Tell us something that you've learned from the program and then um, how you're gonna apply it to your job. Marissa, if you could get to the slide that has Buffalo State on it, that's where we'll find Jess's name. We're gonna start with her so that she can get to where she needs to be. Please and thank you. Can we sit up here? Okay, great. So I think the second slide. Okay. Here we go. Okay. Make sure it doesn't advance. <laughs> oh. There we go. Okay, Jess, you're up. can't hear you, Jess, so if you're on the phone and you have yourself muted, be sure to unmute yourself. If you're using computer audio, let's see if we can uh, find Jess. Jess, are you the 716 number? Okay. 
I saw mm -hmm. her name. Yeah. All right, she's gonna, she um, couldn't use her computer audio. Oh. All right. Okay. Well, try now because I unmuted you from this from this end. You're unmuted. You should be able to speak now. Mm. While we're trying to find you, Jess, why don't we go ahead and move on to Brian at UB, which is the next slide. Uh, because I think, Brian, you may have a conflict too. Uh, yes. Um, thanks for letting me go uh, earlier. Um, <clears throat> I was thinking about this uh, uh, this morning, and I think I think one of the uh, one of the things I learned uh, through Rava was just how how uh, vast um, RF is, and, and and certainly what an appreciation it's given me to know that um, there's so many of Um, that is the endeavor to, which has a tendency to become things that I don't touch on a day to day. Um, that I, I found you know very very interesting and I just wanted to thank the Research Foundation for, for providing this this year and um, you know I tend to be a little bit biased but you know I was part of a you know from guidance presentation so naturally I, I got to work with some pretty pretty and uh, I got to meet folks at RF Central this year which I hadn't before um, and I always uh, remember that and cherish that experience Oh, nice. Uh, also, in addition to that, I, I hope I hope to be a constant attendee at the symposiums from now on. I got to go to my first one this past year, and I I was uh, just amazed at how how large we truly are uh, across the state, and uh, it uh, gave me a deeper appreciation for for what we do. So, thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll go back to the beginning uh, of our folks and ask individuals who may be from UAlbany on. Charlene and Lori, I believe you're on. I don't know if Jade and Maggie or Megan are there, but. Charlene or Lori, I think you may have asked a question earlier, so maybe you can unmute. We have um, someone in the chat here. Um, Donna Williams, right? I can't see. Okay, I'm sorry, can you read that? Marissa? Sure, yep. First, I would like to thank everyone. This has been very helpful over the past year. I enjoyed learning more about audits. I gained greater insight on making purchases related to awards and the importance of understanding the limitations of the award. I now understand that when you are considering a purchase related to an award, you need to make sure it can be supported with appropriate documentation and make sure we follow the compliance policies related to awards, gifts, et cetera, in case you are ever audited. Yes, it's Donna. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Donna. If you guys aren't sure how to unmute yourselves, star six will unmute your line, or we can have Marissa unmute everyone. But of the five people from UAlbany, if there's anyone that would like to chime in, now's your chance. Hello, Charlene here. Good. There we Can go. you hear me? <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Yay. So I just wanted to say that I really enjoyed the 
um, one on audit findings and how to manage them. Um, I really um, enjoyed seeing the common issues reported during an audit, and we are going to use that going forward. I know we have a A133 audit coming up soon, so that was very helpful. Good. Okay, so for me, this is Lori. Um, Charlene, I was unable to see the audit uh, version or the presentation, uh, but just based on what Charlene said, um, I'm going to try and schedule it for most of my folks. She thought it was very helpful, so we're going to try and set up something here so that we do sort of a viewing, like a brown bag lunch, to share it with everyone that's going to be touched by the audit that's coming up this fall. Um, for me, I thought the neuroscience was pretty interesting. Um, and how the leadership lessons from neuroscience, how the, the mechanics of the head actually play into everything. I found that one very interesting. Good. That's a great idea, Lori, about watching it as a group. Um, these are all reported and they're, they're, they're really quality recordings. So I think that's a great idea. Okay, anybody else from UAlbany? No, all right, we're gonna go to Binghamton. Either Michael or Emily. Hi, this is Michael. Hi. Great. Um, I'd, I'd just like to say uh, thanks for including me. I really enjoyed it, and a lot of the, the variety of the topics covered was very interesting. I uh, one thing that I learned that really hit home uh, was kind of recognizing. Uh, the divergent interests, priorities, and responsibilities our faculty have. So I know I have my interest out of research development, uh, but being cognizant of uh, faculty's divergent interests, whether it's teaching courses or other service obligations, and learning how to fit that into scheduling with research development was a big help. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, I um, I thought that one of the sessions that the professor, the faculty did that uh, Carolyn set up for us was really good, kind of hitting that point, Michael. That's great. Thanks. Is Emily there by any chance with you, around you? Uh, I'm not sure. Okay. I don't see her name on the list. Um, how about we go to Peter McLean? All right, can you hear me now? We can. Hey, the star six works. So uh, clearly the most important thing was getting to see Carolyn again for a little bit, but uh, uh, it was nice. <laughs> and I, I enjoyed the, the symposium because, you know, getting to see people, having dinner, all those interactions, working on some of the training stuff. I just think that's, you know, a special thing when you get to be face-to-face uh, -face with other people and put faces with names and uh, getting to see people again and all. I think that's important. I enjoyed it quite a bit. And uh, while I think some of the material hewed closer to like uh, what the, we did in mentoring or some of those other pro training programs, there are little nuggets on each you know, session that you can take away. Maybe you didn't hear them the first time or maybe someone added in something extra. And so I think that to me, that's the takeaway there. I can't necessarily point to like, oh, this one specific uh, training was the one that stuck out to me, but each of them had little bits and pieces that I enjoyed. Good. And Peter, I will uh, send that comment on to Carolyn. I'm yeah, sure. Thank you. <laughs> Good. All right. Let's go um, to the next slide. We got Jessica from Buff State. How about Robert? Are you on? Jess is here. Can you hear me? Oh, I can. We can hear you now. Go, please. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what was going on. I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, I approached the academy just to try and determine, you know, what my leadership ability was, my strengths, my weaknesses, and I wasn't disappointed. From the many sessions, um, I learned, you know, a variety of things, and it wasn't just the presenter I learned from. It was more the comments or maybe a question that my fellow participants had. Mm -hmm. um, kind of like Peter, I jotted down a lot of notes, I think, and just, or, you know, at least some notes in every session. There was something I took away, whether it was, you know, transformational leadership or, um, you know, the six domains of knowledge, just things, or the neuroscience. And then discovering um, 
the Mind Tools website. I think that came up in something because that was in my folder. Um, you know, just different things that I'm now trying to explore or books to read, resources. It's just been a wealth of knowledge that I've greatly appreciated. So I'd like to thank Carolyn, Marissa for filling in today, um, and Kathleen and Jamie. I mean, this was absolutely wonderful for me. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, um, Robert, I don't see you signed in, so I'm gonna assume that's a no, but let's go to Oneonta. Alex or Melissa? Okay, so Melissa um, did put in the chat. My biggest takeaway was from was from Rava was more general and can be applied to wherever my career path takes me. It was from the leadership lessons from neuroscience session and it was about finding your sweet spot for performance and that we should match our environment to our personal performance. I've almost always done this in my various positions, but almost felt guilty about it because it may, it may have looked different from someone else. I feel like this is this has freed me up to excel and really contribute my best to my employer without comparing myself to others. I always felt the navigating your ship through the academic minefield was very informative and helped me better work with faculty on a regular basis. Also, I want to thank everyone who made this learning experience. Oh, I think we're getting a lot of comments. <laughs> Okay. Also want to thank everyone who made this learning experience possible and to everyone else who contributed and participated. It's Melissa from UB, smiley face. Okay. Sorry, I said that a little early. <laughs> yeah, it's a different Melissa, but I was glad to hear from her. Is Melissa Nicosia on the phone? Alexandra. Um, okay. From Oneana has a and then, yes, um, Alexandra had said, I'm having audio issues as well. It was a great experience to learn just how diverse our campuses are. We don't do a lot of research at our campus. We have lots of migrant programs. So it was interesting to learn more about actual research programs. It was also great to be able to hear all of the best practices that were offered throughout the year and to learn about topics that are not part of my job. For example, during the uniform guidance session, the part about retroactive payroll redistribution and the reports that are available, or the IFR changes and those reports. It's something that I can share with my coworker who does all of that. Overall, it was a great experience. Thank you. Melissa N. is out today. Okay. <laughs> How about Suzanne? Or Cyrus from Optometry. Susanna is not here. Cyrus is here. Cyrus, I unmuted you if you'd like to try to speak to us. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Yes. Oh, there you go. I was trying to press star six. Yeah, so for me, um, they actually told me to join this because they told me that it's going to be helpful for me being new to sponsor programs. And it really did, you know, I learned a lot of things. And, um, you know, it's like, I noticed that, you know, the things that I'm observing from our end, I realized it's not only happening to our campus, you know, that's, that it's happening to a lot of locations. And I think, um, like, especially like today, uh, about how federal grants are kind of declining and, you know, like we have to consider looking into clinical trials and sponsored, I mean, industrial, industry sponsored um, trials, you know, all those things. And yeah, so all in all, this is like a great experience and I would like to thank everyone um, for having me here. Thank you, Cyrus. All right, let's go to UB. We've heard from Brian and we heard from Melissa. Is there anybody else that's on? Hello. Hi. Hi. Hi, this is Lisa Zimmerman. Hi, Lisa. Okay, uh, a couple of the sessions that really stood out to me. Um, one back in May, the navigating yourself through the academic minefield. And I've shared this with several of my colleagues. 
regarding, you know, or for people who didn't quite understand what faculty go through, what their lifestyle is like with the proposal and pressure deadlines, but also vice versa or something related to that. It was really nice to hear that staff, that the faculty need to be cognizant that staff have their own areas of critical expertise, and that really resonated with me, and I've repeated that many times. Um, also, the unleashing the power of data analytics to lead, that really updated my exposure to where we are. And in the state of the art, I was, I was awfully behind, and that was awakening to, see, to, to, to hear those. And now have invested more time into using data analytics to improve our student experiences and outcomes. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Martina, I have unmuted. Yeah, Martina is there, and I think Sevi is there. Did I see that? Yes, uh, this is Martina. I'm here with Wei and Sunny. I'm just going to go ahead first. Okay. Um, thanks again for the opportunity. And um, throughout the Rava program, actually, the program provides a wide range of topics and actually depth for each topic. Um, it's, it's interesting because, you know, I'm in the center office. So we do grants management, but throughout the Revit program, actually, there's a lot of different topics that kind of remind us to say, okay, yep, there's also part of it kind of related to grants management and related to the RF. So it's actually refreshing. Um, as far as what I would use to apply for the uh, to to the job, um, so far for some of the sessions that if I see is applicable and interesting, to, like I said, a lot of stuff is actually pretty in depth training and with the recorded um, links coming out from the office from the central. I've been forwarding them to um, within our office and also on our campus we have kind of like a research admin network. So I've been sharing those information so then um, folks in Buffalo are also not just within our office but at campus level they'll also be aware of that as well. So thank you. Great news. Love to hear that. This is Sunny. Uh, we, we learn a lot from uh, all the findings and uniform guidance. There's a lot of information, and then we uh, also share the information with all of our office. We have a lot of discussion about it. So uh, thank you for the very helpful sections. Uh, hi, this is hi, this is Wei, and as Sunny mentioned, uh, Sunny and I we are both like award analysts. So the most interesting uh, topic for us is the study of the uniform guidance um, with. Uh, we discuss a lot of topics that, like the findings from the auditing, uh, the, 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 uh, the example that we shared during the session, and um, we do like a brainstorm at, uh, at our one uh, our NS meeting, and we find that very helpful, and it help us like to restructure our uh, knock, uh, um, review procedures and make our policy more clear and um, also we like uh, for me like I uh, previous I just like when I came across a question we refer to the and I um, the guidance like the beautiful guidance for reference but now we um, we kind of bought that book and we just start from the beginning um, uh, and see what we to fresh our knowledge yeah, that's what my take out. Wow, that's great. Yeah, and if you can keep it going on your campus, I think that would really be wonderful. Anybody else from UB? Um, I think Netta has her typed up in the comments. Okay. Do you see that, Marissa? Mm -hmm. I can read it. I can see it from here. My role is so small within the scope of research administration at SUNY, even after 20 years at UB, it's always eye-opening to take a peek into the variety of factors that make up research administration as a whole. I look forward to continuing to partner with my colleagues who are an invaluable resource in the UB-sponsored projects office, as well as those across the university and the research foundation statewide. It is my hope that I will continue to be able to attend the symposium to further build upon foundation Brava has established for me. And then Jennifer Roods, I don't know if there, was she's, yeah, at a, she's at Upstate. She's at Upstate. Is yeah. there anybody else from UB? Again, it's star six if you're on the phone to unmute yourself. 
Otherwise, we'll move to the next. Yeah, let's go to ESF. Slide. ESF folks. I know Lisa helped uh, form a panel with uh, Brian from UB. Thank you. For this doing. is sorry, Kathleen. This is Kate. Oh, good. As in Kate Edwards. Yes, it is. Good. What do you got? So, uh, thank you so much for my, allowing me to participate. This has been a really great experience. Um, the biggest takeaways for me is just how collaborative and um, how, how collaborative everyone has been with um, including comments in the chats and um, really just opening up my eyes. I'm going to echo Jess from Buffalo's comments where, you know, really writing down notes from colleagues and things that I hadn't thought of before. I'm um, just really appreciative of the opportunities both in RAVA and outside of RAVA that I've been able to participate in and engage more with my colleagues um, from other campuses. And then it's really just helped me to be more creative but consistent with some of the stuff that I um, have been like approached with in my work and my um, day to day duties. So this has just been a really great experience. That's great, Kate. Thank you. I know we've had you on a design team. That was fun. It was great. I loved doing that. Good. I hope to participate again soon. Yeah. Uh, okay, anybody else from ESF? Cheryl or Susan? No, I don't see any folks. Okay. How about um, our next page? We've got system with um, Clarice. Are you on by any chance? Well, okay. We heard from Donna Williams, but how about from Jennifer from Upstate? So Jennifer um, replied in the chat, I definitely enjoyed bits and pieces, as Peter said earlier, from each session. Thank you. One takeaway I can share would be from the Unleash the Power of Data, data Analytics to Lead session. Going forward, my plan is to utilize data metrics in a better way to help support the growth of my office and the overall research mission of the RF and Upstate. Thanks. Okay, I'm here at Central Office. Uh, we've got Janice, Alona, and Sue. <coughs> I'll start with you, Alona. Um, actually, that we have our sessions on to help you to analyze the game that the research administration can use in a very complex matter. What is it that I'm having a little trouble hearing. Oh, okay. Yeah, you can't speak up. The speaker's way up there. I'm sorry. Um, the sessions, uh, the rubber session, help you to uh, realize that the research administration is a very complex matter. But it's the good news also that, that we can learn from each other, one campus from each other, from the experience, from the previous experience. And I also enjoy the uh, leading people at the Symposium when you could put faces into the names. And I think I like very much the session, the technological session. And also, I think that it will help you to um, apply some tips from the organization to organize myself better. I nice. Like Great. How about you, Jan? Um, I think, as as many people said, the leadership lessons really hit home with me. Um, all just the different facets of it, and then how to mesh that together with um, the work-related knowledge that we also learned about. Um, and again, just listening to others' comments and questions, and um, understanding the faculty perspective. Um, every day you learn something new, no matter how much you think you know, um, you're always learning something new. So for me, that was that was a really great part of it, is to just listen to other people and learn things from, from them, um, and then um, put it together with the, the leadership lessons and the six domains. I really enjoyed those. Thank you. How about you, Sue? I enjoyed the sessions. Um, one of the biggest takeaways I had was um, on how to work effectively in a legal, compliant, and ethical regulatory environment. Um, the short title was saying no to power. And 
um, the speaker talked about integrity, not just when it's convenient, but even when it might be um, uncomfortable for you to go and say something about something that you're seeing or hearing. And um, they brought out practical suggestions like picking your battles wisely, share your goals and outcomes with your teammates, request information or help, and be constructive, and don't go to war every time. So I really enjoyed those, and I took away a lot from that um, session. Thank you. Uh, is um, Julio on the call from SPO? No? Okay. So um, we've got Polly. So I'm sorry when I said Melissa Miller was from Buffalo. That might have been Melissa Miller from Polly, since we have two of them. Okay. Um, is Kim on or Catherine or Car I think Carly's on. Yes. Carly, I've just unmuted you if you'd like to. Well, I'm going to be trying to unmute you. There you go. You should be unmuted, Carly, if you'd like to try. If you used your phone audio, it's star six. Hello. Hi, there you go. Hi. Oh, perfect. So I, as many other people said, um, I enjoyed the leadership session. And I think Susan Phillips from UAlbany presented about the PI's roles, yeah. and she outlined that all the pressures that they face. So becoming more aware of those and understanding um, the PI's motivations um, really helped me keep a positive and open line of communication with them. So I really like that session. Awesome. Good. Anybody else on from Polly? Yeah, I'm here with Carly. This is Melissa. Oh um, Kim is out today, okay. so she won't be able to give her feedback for you. But um, I really enjoyed um, the contract presentation. Uh, mm -hmm. I thought it was an excellent overview of you know contracts and the process that they go to, um, you know that they go through. Excuse me. Um, it just came away with a better understanding of how they're put together. Um, and I also enjoyed the leadership lessons from neuroscience. Um, I think it was a great reminder of what I need to do in order to be successful, but also what I need to do that even though I'm not a leader of a team to help you know, people who I work with become successful um, and you know, how I can have a positive impact you know, on the people in my, my department. But, um, and overall, I thought it was a really great 12 months of learning and I, I did have other takeaways that I can apply to my, my day to day. That's great, well, Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome, thank you. Uh, anybody else? So I know you said Kimberly's not there. How about Catherine? I didn't see her name. Okay. So how about Stony Brook? Do we have anybody from Stony Brook? Uh, I think Lori might be on. Lori put something on the comments. As to Michelle Hawk. Yes. Okay. So Michelle first said, I am off campus today working remotely as we are having our HVAC system in our office updated, so I'm limited on audio. I found the contracts, ministry, contracts Masterclass and the auditing session the most helpful in terms of my daily realm of work. I really liked the leadership abilities session. It was very helpful. I enjoyed the neuroscience session too. I feel that these have all been beneficial to me on a daily basis and enhance the work I do daily. Thank you for the opportunity. That was Michelle at um, Stony Brook. Yeah. And then Lori writes, Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for this program. I've learned so much. The contract sessions helped me, under, helped me understand more about working with contracts and what to look for and explain some things I was not completely clear on since I do not set up the contracts and did not know how much was involved. I also learned from the audit session and find them more critical of how I do things. I also enjoyed attending the symposium for the first time and attending the different workshops and interacting with others from the various campus campuses and central office. I look forward to future programs like RAVA and attending another symposium. Nice. You know, it, it, I'm so happy to hear that people were able to attend the symposium. We did put it on the calendar. 
and yet I didn't get to see everybody, although we were, many of us were at dinner together. So I'm really glad that it was a positive experience. Is there anybody we didn't get uh, a chance to listen to or hear from in chat? Hi, this is Christine from Stony Brook. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Hi. How are you? Um, I did some of the notes that I had written down was that one that I realized throughout this 12 months that um, sponsor programs office isn't this big mean entity and just creating <laughs> rules on its own. It's um, nice to see that there's uh, SUNY RF is behind and then like a driving force for support and um, available for any questions and helping us take in funding. I work outside of sponsor programs. so. Um, it was never really clear to me like where um, the policies were being established from, so that was helpful to learn. Okay. Um, out of the sessions that I really enjoyed, I, I thought the audit one was great. I never realized that there were so many different types of audits. Um, I'm definitely going to keep it in mind. Every time I create a proposal, I, I kind of have like this audit person on my shoulder now, <laughs> just watching me create things. Um, and then the common thread that I um, took throughout the whole 12-month uh, period was the importance of education, the importance of not only from an administrative standpoint um, that we become more educated in what we do and why we do it, but also from a faculty standpoint, you know, and how we can help educate them um, about the processes. And me, also, I enjoyed the RF Symposium, and I hope that I get to go again. Good. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Lori from um, Stony Brook is in the chat. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for this program. I've learned so much. The contract session helped me understand more about working with contracts and what to look for and explain some things I was not completely, completely clear on since I do not set up the contracts. I do not know how much I was involved. Did I already read Yes. This? Why do I feel like, okay, sorry. But thank you. I My would, apologies. I, it's very hot in the room we're in. <laughs> <sighs> Anybody else from Stony Brook? Okay. I think then we've heard from everybody who's either on the chat or on the phone. Does that look right, Marissa and Jamie? We've just about got everybody. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think we have everybody. And there's no more um, messages in the chat, it looks like. Good. So I guess uh, there's a couple things. One of them, I'm really happy to hear that some of these sessions went over well because from our perspective, we weren't sure based on the fact that this is virtual. You're not, I, you're not getting any, I can't see anybody's faces, but I can't tell if it um, appealed to you. So I'm really happy to hear that some of these Either the ones that the Sale Institute, you know, were able to bring to the table, faculty and some um, staff, or the ones that we developed here in house. Um, I'm really happy to hear that many of you liked the same, some of the same sessions. So next up, um, we'd like you to know that we have a certificate uh, that has a sort of an acknowledgement of the RAVA program with your name on it. So you'll be getting that. And also, I will be looking for some volunteers to help me design the next session. So we're due to have another academy in January of 2020. I don't really know what it's going to look like. I, I'm not sure yet. I'm hearing that some of the sessions that we did that are recorded we can use as a demo and discuss. I'm hearing a lot of people like the face-to-face, -face, and so we'll obviously get all of your good feedback uh, from the RAVA program. Jamie's been excellent in keeping all of this sort of organized and in order. But again, we will be looking for volunteers uh, to help plan the next session. We'll be designing the next academy uh, starting in the fall, probably September and October. So with that, I want to say congratulations and a big thank
thank you to Carolyn and to Marissa today for filling in. And uh, I'd like us to do a virtual round of applause for Jamie Kingsley, who has been here for every single one of these and has helped me uh, tremendously. So a round of applause, it's virtual. <laughs> and with that said, congratulations. Thank you very much. And we look forward to your feedback.